folks. I'm uh, reporting in from Philadelphia. I'm uh, spending a little bit of time this afternoon in the University City area by the University of Pennsylvania. And you know, I have something coming up um, in, in a little bit, but on my way in, I just wanted to, to stop and do a couple site visits to places on the campus of the our larger campus of the University of Pennsylvania and the uh, sort of science and technology corridor. And so this is, here, let me just show you. Um, 3675 um, West Market Street, they're, let's see, oh, front end workers, they're thanking them. I'm, I'm standing by this little bulletin board outside of this office, and after that thank you to front end, frontline workers, there's a lot of stuff about uh, your startups and gene therapies and bio labs. So, uh, oh look, ideas become impact. We've got the impact stuff here, and co-working, because now we're not gonna actually get to have our own jobs with uh, our regular office that we're just gonna have to you know do gig work and and rent out co co-working spaces so I came here especially because this is part this is part of the University City District this is sort of one of these public private partnership centers here in Philadelphia this corridor is very techy um, you can see you know just sort of these mid-rise office buildings all the way down but there's been a lot of investment in the past five or six years um, oh in, in this area. Anyway, I just, I wanted to stop at 3675 here because this is the office building of the Character Lab. And the, the Character Lab is important because it's a project of Angela Duckworth. Angela Duckworth is a professor of psychology here at the University of Pennsylvania. She was formerly with McKinsey Associates and she and her husband both, uh, I think he's in real estate. and. Her character lab concept has been around for a long time. She was named a MacArthur Genius Award winner. And essentially it's about sort of tracking people's soft skills, but particularly grit. She's known as the grit professor. And you know, this, this idea of grit is essentially sort of putting it back on the individual to navigate uh, really horrific problems and just sort of bootstrap yourself. And if you just have the right attitude, you know, you'll be fine no matter that the whole social systems are broken down. And you know, I I I've come here particularly. Um, she, you know, she's been doing a lot of work on like reverse engineering certain subsets of populations, and she was actually doing work at my child's school for a while, which was a magnet school here in Philadelphia. It was a public school, but it was a magnet school, and so th this idea was that she would. Uh, engineer sort of reverse engineer what it takes to be someone at a magnet school and she was also doing work with uh lower in lower marion school district which is a very affluent school district around here so her work she had submitted a proposal to this macarthur 100 and change award several years ago where they were going to award 100 million dollars to solve a global problem and ultimately the winner of that was the the irc and sesame workshop to data mine syrian refugee kids and she made it she made the cut several several series of, like through the competition but she didn't actually win the award and then her project was later funded by uh Chan Zuckerberg, so Mark Zuckerberg, again, on character development, and she has sort of these checklists of skills. Um, Angela Duckworth, her focus is grit, and you know, it always seemed unsettling, but the more we realize about the world that's being created, this sort of virtualized world of augmented reality and global competitiveness and, you know, post-truth and post-literacy, it really feels like this idea of grit is to triage individuals like as part of a larger sort of social eugenics experiment to see, you know, who are going to be the winners in this sort of dystopia future that they have planned. So I'm just going to, um, here, I'm going to flip it around. The, 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 I'm going to walk a little bit. I've got my bags. The next, the next, um, so this is, this is where the character lab is, Angela Duckworth's. Um, whoops, sorry. The next office building just next door is 3701 Market Street, and that's uh, the office of Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman is part of this, um, well, he's done a lot of work in positive psychology, and a lot of his work is around learned helplessness. And actually his research was used in Guantanamo in terms of ultimately by, in terms of torturing people into submission. And he said he didn't really need it for that, but that is ultimately how it was used. Now he's also a collaborator with uh, KIPP Charter Schools, Knowledge is Power, which is a no excuses charter chain. 
Uh, here, I'll just turn around. So we have this, oh, okay. There's the subway going on underneath us, sorry. This is just um, the public art outside. Sorry, you can go by if you want. Um, you know, you can see the rainbow theme here, sorry. And uh, so, yeah, so you, you know, you've got rainbows here, like this little pop of color in the glass, uh, the glass world. Uh, this is Seligman's building. And I have to double check. I think he may be the contact for this World Wellbeing Project, which is essentially about using sentiment analysis and social media to uh, do analyses of individuals and populations as regarding their mental health and well-being. So that's really problematic knowing, sorry, I'm standing here by the ventilator for the, the L since I'm running under the street. Um, but Seligman is important. This learned helplessness, the use of positive psychology is all part of these equations for social emotional learning. And his connection with KIPP charter schools, KIPP, which was originally, I believe, a concept from a, a teacher in Houston, but was co-opted by some Penn students and turned into this no excuses charter program. Um, and that really in this, you have to earn everything. Like you have to earn your right to have a desk. You, it's, it's very, the children have a lot of physical discipline, um, emotional discipline. They're not supposed to talk. They're supposed to keep their hands at their sides. Um, uh, they, they, they're supposed to gesture in sort of robotic ways about their compliance to the, the instruction that's being delivered. And so it's, it's really scary because I think ultimately the plan, as you sort of start to look at um, charter cities, Paul Romer out of NYU, and this idea of carving out um, special exception zones that could be run by co corporations or public-private partnerships on, along different rules, the idea would be like to kip the world, to turn the world into a crazy, no excuses, disciplined charter chain. And, you know, again, I'm just, I'm coming out to say like, where is this stuff happening? You know, it's happening in your average office park, you know, with some nice rainbow sculpture here. And, you know, behind the glass, what is going on behind this glass? Um, you know, th there are people who are getting, you know, five, six figure salaries, you know, with lots of benefits and lots of social prestige and pats on the back as MacArthur geniuses and fellowships and CVs that are pages and pages long. But are they building the world that we actually want? Is this the world? And did anyone, one of us have a say about learned helplessness and positive psychology and having our character tracked and, and compliant, making us compliant to a world that is fundamentally broken? I mean, I will just show down here, you might not be able to see it, but this is all, um, redevelopment coming in you can kind of see it's being rebuilt this is all gentrification and that building that is right there was actually the site of the university city high school so you know no, i know a number of you guys are familiar with the fact that i got involved in this through the school closures in 2013 boston consulting group was closing our schools and university city high school was one of those schools and again not to say that the school didn't have issues or need further investment but they certainly did, didn't need to close it and then sort of hand off th this school, which you're never going to get this real estate now in downtown Philadelphia, just to hand it off. Uh, you know, I just, I just want to make this connection between the, 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 the character mine, the character trait analytics, a larger eugenics program, gentrification, and that it's all packaged as sort of this beautiful, you know, innovative startups with, you know, some nice fun art that you can distract yourself with as they take over the world. So Anyway, I'm gonna to try to hip a couple other places on the way, but this is really important. Martin Seligman, look him up. Angela Duckworth, look her up. They're, they're part of the key element in this uh, social impact space, especially around behavioral compliance. I've said a couple times that a lot of times it seems like the graduate programs or the universities are actually just being set up as places to create markets for the business schools. And so it's really interesting to me because Penn Graduate School of Education has been a real leader in pushing uh, ed tech and educational technology for uh, for schools, K-12 schools. They've, they've sponsored numerous conferences. Uh, a number of their professors have connections to the United Nations with their digital education program. And so you can see this, the School of Education and then there's the a cylindrical building just at the, the bottom there uh, with the, the red. That's the Huntsman Business School. So that is Wharton. That is where I'm, I'm aiming to go. So if we if we think about that the school if we think about universities as being sort of these complicit partners in the financialization of 
of our, our bodies, of our intellects, of our social relationships. And that if we understand that this, the most prestigious schools, those are the schools that they want so that they can say, so that they can brand this as a good thing. So the University of Pennsylvania, as I have mentioned previously, is a center for impact investing. Judith Rodin, who was the former president when she left, she became the head of the Rockefeller Foundation and they created Global Impact Investment Network through the Rockefeller Foundation. So um, you can see now there's, a, there's the Huntsman School again. And I will say that the Huntsman family is from Utah. I was just visiting Utah and they made their money in chemicals. And their, I think their first breakthrough product was styrofoam, the plastic, uh, the styrofoam clamshells for a McDonald's, the, the McDonald's hamburgers were sold in. But they went into a, quite a diversified portfolio of plastic petrochemicals. And then through their philanthropy, they went into to cancer research. So they were doing lots with genomics, but then now all of the genomic research is being leveraged into biotech and genetic therapies and creating whole new markets that are, in my opinion, moving us towards transhumanism. So, you know, I had started my talk when I went to Utah saying, are we doing, you know, they're talking about gene editing bees to live in chemicals. And I said, you know, there's two routes. Either we, we engineer the bees to live in the chemicals or we try to create and heal the world so the bees don't have to live in the chemicals because ultimately we're the bees. That's what's coming, we're the bees. So I just wanna situate this geographically. This is, the, this is the Graduate School of Education that I just walked past. And you know, of course we can see the you know, social justice signaling, Black Lives Matter, you know, no walls and that sort of thing. You know, right next door to the building that's going to financialize everyone and put everybody into a geofence. But you know, we we have you know this these little signs here attesting to our interest in these issues, and yet not making the connection that that the the graduate programs are actually feeding the impact markets that are being designed by Wharton. Here is the social uh, social service building. So these are all kind of the older buildings because they don't get a lot of money. Essentially, they're just feeders for these markets. But this is the social welfare building. And when I talked to you about Angela Duckworth not winning that prize and instead uh, the MacArthur Prize went to uh, IRC and IBM and Sesame Workshop and the Nudge Unit and that she got funding from, from you know, Facebook to continue her work. All of the, the projects that didn't get chosen for the final round, they ended up in something called the Center for High Impact Philanthropy, which is also based here at Penn. And Penn is one of the, the six centers connected to the NYU GovLab in data analytics. So again, this, the graduate programs in social work and social programs are feeding into the impact space market. And then just the last section here, this is the psychology building. Again, these are really horrible buildings. Like you can sort of see how this is set up. These are not the loveliest buildings in terms of getting resources, but you know, I don't know if Seligman and Duckworth teach in the psychology building or if their work is limited over into the sort of the high tech center there over on Market Street. But we know that psychology is, is a huge part of what's coming in terms of all of this measurable behavior change that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are about using digital surveillance and financial technologies to enact behavior change, which is about manipulating psychology. And then the building that I didn't actually say, but right next to the Graduate School of Education is the Annenberg School of Communication. The Annenberg School of Communication and the arts, which are all now digital, are essentially um, funded by Walter Annenberg. He was in publishing and his publishing, you know, among the, his holdings were um, Playboy and uh, TV Guide. So we really are talking about psychological programming, programming people for what future. Again, this is a future that is largely about transhumanism and dehumanization, derealization, separating us from the real world, putting us into a virtual world so that they can extract profit from us as data and social control through the impact markets. The, the Worcester Institute uh, here on the University of Pennsylvania's campus. And this is significant because the Worcester Institute isn't actually part of the university. It's an independent nonprofit and it was started in the 1890s and it was one of the first sort of biotechnology um, ventures in the country and they've played a major role in 
a lot of biomedical research, including the development of the rubella vaccine, and I guess an improved rabies vaccine. Uh, but the other piece of this that I was not aware of is that uh, evidently the albino rats that are used in medical experimentation were developed here. And that almost half of the all rats, lab rats used in medical research now uh, are traced to the, the rats that were developed at the Worcester Institute, which is really kind of crazy. And I, you know, I, I want to go back and reread uh, Mrs. Frisbee and the rats of NIMH because it feels like there's some important stuff going on there that I want to um, like revisit because that was a really touching story for me as a kid. But again, I just want to show the Worcester Institute of Anatomy. It was started in the 1890s. And there was a giant extension put on within the past decade. So, um, you know, Penn is a center of biomedical research. And, you know, if I can, I might try to stop by the, um, the a Abramson Cancer Center because that's where they've actually done the first human CRISPR trials with gene editing. And, you know, I still continue to have concerns about, you know, is our morality caught up for the kinds of tools that are being developed in the in the scientific community. Because everything that I can sense, especially around the social impact agenda, especially around predictive analytics and coming up with new ways to turn humans and social relationships and our bodies into profit centers for data, data analytics, um, you know, the, the big pharma that it is, is our morality caught up with the tools that they're they're creating? Because I think in many respects, they're sort of playing God in ways that are not ultimately gonna be good for humanity because we just don't have the moral anchor to, to use those tools in a good way. Um, you know, and I'll just touch on here because here's the, the love statue or one of them, um, you know, because I just got back from doing the little ceremony over at Wharton. Because I do think that the answer is comes from a living place that there are many people who sort of want to fight back from a place of anger or righteousness and you know I think coming from a place of humility and and caring is the right answer. Here we are outside of College Hall this is a statue of Ben Franklin and as we know uh, the University of Pennsylvania is Ben Franklin's university and you know I want to make sure to get this image because um, Roz Ben, who's done some really in interesting interpretation of public art in Philadelphia, uh, in reading the public art, especially along the parkway, his contention is that Ben Franklin uh, opened the gates of hell with Prometheus in Philadelphia. <laughs> and it was sort of to, to have power and knowledge and that this was sort of a bad bargain that was made. And he reads that through the sculptures from the art museum on forward um, and the Washington Monument in Philadelphia and Aikens Oval has an image of Franklin and I'm trying to remember the other gentleman. He was like the soldier pastor, Muhlenberg maybe, who was carrying the covered book, which is alluded to being the book of the Illuminati. So, uh, you know, this idea of Franklin opening the gates of hell, I do think of it increasingly in terms of what's going on in the biotech field and the CRISPR field. And, um, in terms of wealth inequality and the use of technology and finance to control populations. So I just want to sort of show that, so there's the Franklin statue there by College Hall and then you walk across and then this is a, a very um, well-known uh, sculpture. It's here like opposite the library. It's uh, th this button and it was by Klaus Oldenburg who does sort of pop art of everyday objects and sort of the legend with a button or what is said is that, you know, the idea that, um, you know, Franklin had kind of a, a considerable girth on him and that, you know, at one point he popped his button and the button rolled over and, it, and, then, it, and then it broke in half. And so I think that's an interesting story to consider if we're thinking about wealth inequality and, um, you know, doing things to excess and not having a full understanding of the long-term consequences is that, you know, what if, what if the world is represented by the Ben Franklin's button, you know, that, 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 that we have gone to a point of excess and, um, you know, 
certain people having way too many resources and then, you know, the buttons popped off and now it's broken. You know, what, what does this mean for, for pen and a broken world? Um, especially when we have institutions like social entrepreneurs at Wharton who are making money off of the breaking of the world and then professing to fix it with fixes that are never actual fixes. So, you know, I just wanted to take a minute and bring in the button and, and Franklin and the gates of hell and CRISPR into the conversation. In this building here, I spent a lot of time in here when I was in graduate school I, with getting my master's in historic preservation. This is the Fisher Fine Arts Library. It's quite a beautiful building by Frank Furness. Um, you know, I'm stopping here because I just want to bring attention to this. On the top floor of this building a number of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, I actually I attended a, a meeting. It was a meeting that was open to the public in that space. Um, that top floor was converted to, I think, a center for some sort of energy like an energy center which is interesting in the fine arts library but the the guest speaker was neil Kleiman, who is from nyu and connected to the nyu gov lab and the e-government movement and uh, there were people there from the mayor's office connected to the nudge unit and someone who was there from the knight foundation which is the internet of things and you know sitting there in that meeting and it just is one of the few just regular people who were there somebody who was not connected you know, they, they had sort of framed it as the behavioral scientist, you know, and I, you know, I remember tweeting back when I first saw the invitation, like, who put the behavioral scientists in charge of city government? You know, that seems like a really bad idea. There's a building up there. And, you know, so I went to this meeting and, you know, it was, it was nice. It had a, like brown box lunches and, you know, it, I would say there were maybe 80 people or so in, in, in the room. And, you know, at one point someone asked a question. I don't know how it came up. It was during the lunch and someone was saying, well, you know, like, uh, like the black community drinks too much bottled water. That that's a problem. They shouldn't be drinking so much bottled water. And of course this is like within the con like people's totally f forgetting the context of Flint and the fact that we're poisoning people's waters in certain communities. And someone at one of the tables said, Oh, but you know, the impact investors are all meeting over at the Sierra center this weekend. I bet they would have a good answer for that about how to stop people from drinking bottled water. And I hadn't really even heard of uh, total impact at the time. But that was the first the first meeting of total impact was at the Sierra Center and that was the event that Mary Scullion was talking about. So, you know, clearly there are so many people in my city who are aware of the fact that there are social problems that are going to be taken advantage of for profit, but that it all is going to be happening through uh, the behavioral sciences and data analytics and surveillance. And it's, it's to, again, further concentrate power in the hands of a few people, but it's happening in these like, you know, beautiful places. And, you know, I, I just, I do love, I do love this building. It's a gorgeous building, but you know, I end up in these meetings where I find out things that on reflection, you, you have to wonder why there aren't more people in those buildings, in those meetings, questioning what's really going on. And it's because they're getting nice salaries to not question. Okay, so if we understand that the end game is to virtualize life and put it in this sort of binary code into augmented reality space and potentially eventually into some space that isn't even augmented reality that is full on virtualized. We're not even a headset. We just exist as the Japan Institute of our Science and Technology Agency says, you know, as thought outside of a physical body in time and space. Then it, it started here. Um, so this is the Moore School uh, here on the University of Pennsylvania's campus. We're at uh, 33rd and Walnut Street. You can see that building right across the way is another science building um, that's connected to the Nanotechnology Center. So the, the clear glass building beyond is new construction. That's the Nanotechnology Center. Again, um, you know, most people are not even fully aware of what's going on with nanotechnology, but there are a number of schools that are part of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, including Penn. But this is, this is the Moore School. It was built in the 1920s, and um, this is the home of ENIAC. And so ENIAC was the first, um, the first multi-purpose computer. Uh, let me see. Uh, so it was, uh, I guess, Turing, Turing compliant. It was the first computer that could store a program. And it was built here between 1943 and 1946. And I think ultimately it was used in calculating the trajectories for missiles. And so they would say, oh, you know, you could put in a, you could program an equation 
and you an equation that would take a human being 20 hours to do to calculate the trajectory of a missile that that any act could do it in 30 seconds and so really the computer industry was birthed here at the university of pennsylvania and it said that one of the the faculty on staff here uh, created the first computer company which sold i guess univac was the type of computer and so i feel like when we're talking about the rise of artificial intelligence about sort of remaking life into um computer code of doing these uh, gene editing with digital technology of doing the cybernetics that this is you know clearly there's a lot going on at MIT there's a lot going on at Stanford but when we make this connection between the technologies that are going to enable human capital markets through wearable tech through digital surveillance through facial recognition like it is all ultimately coming back here to 33rd and Walnut so you know again just to sort of show that there, this is that next to it is the Skirkanich building of applied sciences there's a whole section here of electrical engineering ultimately the plan is to turn life into an electrical engineering equation but it had to start somewhere and like i said i'm i'm the landscape person and so you know i'm i'm here to try to explain a little bit of what this landscape is and that it lives you know on ivy league campuses in places that are esteemed and you know, considered very prestigious. And yet I think increasingly we don't have a good sense of morality to use these sort of high tech tools. Sorry, I'm crossing the street that are that are coming into our disposal because we are not um, we're not living in a world where people are open to sharing resources, being egalitarian coming from a place of spirit and right relationships and reciprocity, you know, in many respects, institutions like this are, you know, if you get the brass ring, if you have the right connections, if you can buy your way in, or if you're the poor kid that can bootstrap, maybe you can get the Ivy League education. And then what happens at that point? You get the education and, you know, then it trains you to be one of the overlords. So here's the laboratory for the research of the structure of matter. You know, and this is, this building has gotten renovated recently, but again, we're, we're studying matter, but to, to what end? Um, are we studying matter so that we can create a world without war? Are we studying matter so that we can create peace and create abundance and be respectful of other beings on the planet? Are we studying matter so that we can wage war and virtualize humanity? Because this is, so this is the nanotech center. And I just, you know, want to put this out because the social entrepreneurs will say they're doing all of this work to make the world a better place. But I question that because ultimately I don't see resources being redistributed. I don't see people in positions of power treating others in humane ways. You know, I, I don't see the love in this. I see calculations. I see equations. I think I see rigidity. I don't see sort of a sacred nature of, of life happening here. And, um, you know, I don't know, like maybe this, <laughs> this artwork says it to me, right? I mean, it just, it feels like the goal is to to turn the world into something that can be controlled by humans and you know i just i really do lean into robin wall kimmerer's teachings on this is that we're the young siblings in the universe and we don't really know what we're doing with these technologies at nanotechnology they say that the laws of physics don't apply in the same way that we don't understand it and yet we're putting billions of dollars here's the in the nanotechnology center we're putting billions of dollars into this um and the question is just because you can does that mean that you should does that mean that you should should you try to play god um and who who should get to play god should should it be the most powerful people get to play god or should it be the the humble people um because i feel like the calculus is off here and I don't know. I don't know that it's enough to say it, but I'm just going to be here and I'm going to say it because the history matters. The history of the technology matters. The power disparities matter. And, um, 
You know, I'm gonna make one more stop on my way back to the car. Uh, this is actually the, gonna be the home of Madame Blavatsky, who lived in Philadelphia for a time, and she was uh, she helped create the Theosophy movement, which is really interesting. Um, so you can see we're about a we're a block off of Walnut Street. So this is essentially equidistant. Um, the, the White Dog Cafe, equidistant between uh, Wharton Business School, which is up on the western end, and then the Moore School of Computing and the Nanotechnology Center, which is like two blocks the other way. So this is one of the few areas that still has historic row buildings in, in, in and around the Penn campus. Most of them have been eliminated. But I wanna sort of talk about this particular space. And before I go in, you can see this is, um, you know, a nice pub that we have that serves the college community. But this is what we're dealing with here in Philadelphia is that we have snow on the ground. The road has actually been closed to parking and vehicular traffic on the end because they've the, the restaurant has needed to set up a tent in order to serve people. So you have an outdoor tent, then you have an indoor-ish kind of porch tent where you've got actually, a, I don't know if you can see, but there's a heater stove there. So there, there's like a, a, an open flame next to the plastic burner. It's kind of crazy if you can see that in there. Um, so there's plastic, there's open flames, there's tents, and yet somehow that this, this version is safer than eating in the restaurant. <laughs> and I just, I'm not understanding any of how this is going. And I, and I will say I've been walking around for the better part of, you know, an hour and a half downtown and I haven't seen a single person that has, isn't wearing a mask other than maybe one person who was eating a bagel outside. So, say la vie, I guess it is what it is. But I'm here on Sansom Street. Essentially, I wanna um, talk about the the White Dog Cafe here. Um, let me just watch, watch my, so the White Dog Cafe is here, uh, 3420 Sansom Street. And this is significant to me because you know I've spoken before about sort of some of the mysticism here in Philadelphia that um, you know Johannes Kelpius came uh, from Germany in the 1690s with these monks to this sort of millenarian group to wait out the end of the world. And so there is like a mystical element that runs through and then clearly a lot of the, you know, Philadelphia stories of the founding fathers are interwoven with Freemasonry. Um, but this house, the White Dog Cafe, was actually the home for a while of um, Madame Blavatsky. And Madame Blavatsky was, uh, she grew up in Russia and she was sort of a spiritualist and a philosopher who had spent time as a young person in Tibet and sort of essentially developed what is now known as the Theosophical Movement in the 1875, I believe. And so for a while she had some illness with her leg, like she was lame or there had been an accident. And so when she was here in Philadelphia, there was this white dog that like lay upon her lap and then she was healed by this white dog. And so the White Dog Cafe is, is, what it, it, it is in the building where she lived here. And then in the 1980s, Julie Wicks um, was one of the early promoters of sort of the farm to table restaurant movement here in the city of Philadelphia. And so she acquired the house and uh, then she named the, um, you know, the restaurant after this white dog with Madame Blavatsky, you can see here. Now, it's interesting because, you know, because New Deck has a tent and they don't have a tent. I don't, I don't know if they haven't actually gone out of business at this point or maybe been put on hiatus, but this was, you know, a, a a restaurant that was had you know very w well regarded in sort of uh, innovative foodie scene for several decades and Judy Wicks is a leader in the sustainability movement in the city of Philadelphia and the sort of green movement and was a leader in the sustainable business network which I had always presumed was something every city had was the sustainable business network um, and it wasn't until you know I mentioned this total impact conference uh, that was, you know, a number of years ago at the Sirius Center. Well, the following year, I believe this was in May of 2019. So the first one was 2018. Um, the ne the second one was in uh, the May 1st, 2019. And I went down to protest it because it was all of these impact investors. And I, you know, I couldn't get anyone <laughs> to go with me. Ultimately, Sherry Honkla came late and like I had my little poster board and I'm standing outside the, the law office where they're having this conference and, you know, sort of, gently accosting the people going in to try to tell them what is actually going on with the social impact space and digital surveillance. But one of the people who came in um, towards the end of our uh, time there outside, you know, outside the building um, and Sherry actually engaged with her was Judy Wicks. And so, 
you know, clearly the sustainable business network is embedded within the larger, not surprisingly, United Nations Sustainable Goal agenda. And the fact that these benefit corporations are B Labs, which were set up to be sort of this hybrid public private partnership to run the impact deals, you know, they're being sort of obscured by this idea of nice businesses, nice businesses that give back. Like Warby Parker gives a pair of glasses to, you know, low income kids if you buy a pair of glasses, or Tom Shoes gives a pair of shoes away to low income kids, or, you know, shade grown coffee or fair trade textiles. Like, there are all of these businesses that are being presented as like the good kind of business, right? And what what is going to be happening is the benefit corporations are actually going to be providing cover for what's going to be coming, which is the mass privatization of the entire social welfare state. So just like we're seeing micro schools being branded as benefit corporations like Alt School, um, I'm sure that there will start to be wellness uh, companies that will be branded as benefit corporations, food companies branded as benefit corporations, anything that is ostensibly about um, like remaking the public sphere for these social impact deals, but it's done through a public private partnership, the private partnership will have to meet certain credentials and those are established by the B Lab and these IRIS metrics. And that's all founded by the, the Rockefeller Foundation, which again, links back to Judith Roden, who was the president of Penn. And I'm almost done here. I I'm, you know, I walked down to the end of Sansom Street. You can't throw a rock without hitting stuff around here. Um, this is a new building. I think the economics department is housed in it. And I'll just close by saying, I was in a meeting here a couple years ago, and it was with a gentleman who was a, a professor from Bowdoin, which is where Jeffrey, Canada and Stanley Druckenmiller went, the impact investors, and his twin brother uh, was also working in biotech, and they were there talking about sort of social determinants of health and poverty, and they were talking about working with United Way, and, you know, I stood up and I was asking some very probing questions about the ALICE model, uh, the assets limited income constrained employed, the social impact, the collective impact space, and what it meant, and that I really didn't think you were solving poverty with a digital nudge. You know, and this was a room full of people who are being trained to be social workers and in these public policy spaces. And it's clear that nobody in these rooms actually knows what they're doing. I mean, I, very small numbers of people know what actually is happening. And, you know, I went up right to one of these professors and I'm like, you know, you're not solving poverty with a nudge, right? Like that doesn't redistribute resources from like these giant, the war machine and the petrochemical companies like that, that a nudging a poor person isn't doing that. And she couldn't like, and there were many people in this small circle who were nodding like, yes, yes, we agree. And this other one, she's like, well, I don't know about that, you know, because they can't, because they're getting paid to, to fulfill this arrangement, which, which just perpetuates, perpetuates the harm. And so, and they're, but they're doing it because, and they have all of the right credentials. They have, you know, they have the PhD next to their name. They're, they have the job at, you know, the, the fancy university. They get to go to the wine and cheese receptions. I mean, they get to go in these buildings. Look, I mean, this one, it doesn't even actually say what it is. I'm trying to come over and just see, but this is, I mean, this is all happening in these brand new buildings. There's money, there's money and money and money for buildings to put in policies that are inflicting a lot of harm under the pretense of benevolence. And we have to figure out a way to do it right. We have to figure out a better way. Um, and I think it's gonna have to come through regular people. It's not gonna be, we can't wait for the experts to to come in with their answers because the, the answers the experts are gonna offer are not gonna be true answers.